Volume One, Chapter Five of the Life and Amours of the Beautiful, Gay, and Dashing Kate Percival, the Belle of the Delaware. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life and Amours of Kate Percival, written by herself. Volume One, Chapter Five. Herbert Clarence's History. I was born at Temperanceville, a village in the interior of the state of New York. My father was a rich man, and the house in which we lived was a fine mansion, beautifully situated in the midst of a grove of trees. Up to the age of sixteen nothing occurred worthy of note. Since the time I was eight years of age my father had employed a private tutor to instruct me, but he was a very easy man and allowed me to slight my lessons with impunity. The consequence was that at sixteen I was, comparatively speaking, ignorant. One day my father asked me to write a note for him, and when I handed it to him he was shocked at the numerous mistakes in orthography and composition, and forthwith decided that I must be sent to school. My tutor was dismissed, and the very next week I was sent to a large boarding school in Brooklyn, kept by a Mr. Amis. I soon felt at home in my new position, and liked the change very much making rapid progress in my studies. I was one of the biggest boys in the school, and having in more than one instance proved my courage, I was spared much annoyance from the other boys, who, although they might surpass me in learning, were not my masters in fisticuffs. A year passed in this manner, and during that period I almost recovered the time lost in my early education. I was a favourite both with the boys and the principal of the school, and the days passed very pleasantly until an event occurred which changed the entire tenor of my existence. I had often heard Mr. Amis speak of his daughter, Cordelia, who was in France, finishing her education. During my second year at school she returned home, and the following day I saw her for the first time in the garden attached to the house. At the moment I first beheld her, she was stooping down, gathering flowers. This posture elevated her clothes behind, and I saw a considerable portion of her beautiful legs, the sight of which, for the first time, inspired me with sexual desire. I anxiously waited for her to turn around, that I might see her face. In a few moments she did so, and I was immediately struck with her beauty. She was a brunette, with dark glossy hair, intensely black eyes, regular features, luscious red lips, white teeth, a laughing expression on her countenance, ivory shoulders, rather short stature, broad hips, and a glorious figure. She detected my earnest gaze, but instead of being abashed at it, she merely smiled at me and passed. I judged her to be about twenty years of age. I could not forget Cordelia's smile all that day. It haunted me wherever I went. I was too young to understand its real significance, but it was sufficient to cause an indefinable feeling to take possession of me. When I retired to bed that night, my father had insisted that I should have a room to myself, I noticed that the chamber adjoining mine, which had been shut up ever since I had been at school, was now open and fitted up with new furniture. In answer to my inquiry, I was told that the room was destined for Miss Cordelia. I felt pleased to think that I should have her for such a close neighbour, and I began to think we might become more intimately acquainted. About three nights after this I retired to bed quite late, in fact the whole house had already retired. When I came to Miss Cordelia's room I was surprised to find the door half open, and a brilliant light streaming from it. My curiosity was so aroused that I peeped into the chamber. Great God! A sight met my eyes which took away my breath and riveted me to the floor. The beautiful Cordelia, with nothing on but her chemise, was lying on a sofa. But this was not all. Her back was towards me, and her sole garment was raised above her hips, revealing to me her lovely bottom, the back portion of a pair of the whitest thighs in the world, and the whole of her magnificently formed legs. In lying down she had a curious position, which jutted out her buttocks, and allowed me to see, between her fleshy thighs, the luscious lips of her bijou shaded with black hair. I stood confounded for a moment, but soon recovered myself, as the lovely creature appeared to be asleep. 
I determined to venture into the chamber, that I might obtain a closer view of her concealed beauties. I cautiously glided into the chamber, and found that she did not wake. I advanced close to her, and, kneeling down behind her, examined at leisure the beautiful objects before my eyes. I can find no words to express her exquisite con. The two fleshy lips met close together, showing only a line of coral which curved from her bottom and was lost in a mass of black curly hair. Of course I was perfectly excited at this sight, and in spite of all prudent considerations I could not resist bending my head down and imprinting a kiss on the object offered to my regard. She evidently felt the embrace, for a shiver ran through her body, but she did not open her eyes. I now grew more bold and dividing the lips of her bijou with my tongue, I sought the interior of her grotto, and met at the entrance her stiffened clitoris, which I had no sooner touched, than, as if by instinct, she pressed her bushy mount close to my face. I now moved my tongue slowly in and out of the luscious opening, and she responded by heaves of her buttocks, and in a few moments she poured down a flood of love's elixir. I rose to my feet and was about to withdraw when Cordelia opened her eyes and gazed on me, full in the face. I blushed all over with shame and was about to make a precipitate retreat when the dear girl smiled on me and, seizing my hand, conveyed it to her splendid bubbies. I already read my pardon on her face and clasping my arms around her i pressed her frantically to my heart i kissed her deliriously gluing my lips to her at the same time forcing my tongue into her mouth she returned all my caresses after toying in this manner a little while i slipped her chemise off her shoulders and exposed her two semi-globes to my greedy gaze what lovely objects i kissed them sucked the nipples buried my face between them stroked her belly and played with her hairy mount she too was not unoccupied, for she had unbuttoned my trousers, and was caressing my staff with her hand, capping and uncapping its red head, and with the other hand she tickled my testicles. In a broken voice she confessed to me that she had only pretended to be asleep during my manipulations of her charms, that she desired to enjoy me as much as I did her, and she begged me at once to satisfy her longings. I was all primed and loaded for the combat, and kneeling on the floor I drew her towards me. She stooped down and with her own hand guided my instrument into her salacious notch. I felt it tearing up her vagina, and in a moment our conjunction was complete. She now commenced to move her bottom rapidly on my staff, while I, with my arms clasped round her handsome body, pressed her towards me in such a manner that her snowy breasts beat against my face. I took one of her rosy nipples in my mouth, and while she was pumping up my spermatic treasures, I sucked and titillated the cunning little strawberry top of her alabaster globes. Nor was this all, for I lowered one of my hands and tickled her bottom, sometimes gently slapping her fleshy cushions, at others forcing a finger in le trou de son cul. When she felt this last operation, she could no longer withhold her emission but throwing her arms round my neck, she discharged profusely, at the same moment that I anointed her vagina and thighs with my love juices. I enjoyed her three times before leaving her. We came to a very good understanding together, and it was decided that I should visit her again the next evening, when everybody had retired to bed. I slept soundly that night, and rose the next morning extremely happy for I was cheered up by the thoughts of the joys I was about to experience. I stole into her chamber at the time agreed upon, and found her already in bed. I undressed myself as quickly as possible, and placed the lighted candle at the foot of the bed. I then laid down by her side. During this proceeding Cordelia pretended to be asleep. I placed my hand on her delicious bubbies, and throwing down the sheet, kissed them. She then opened her eyes and smiled sweetly upon me. I placed my hand over her nightdress and raised it gently until I reached her pretty con. I played with the hair of her mount and inserted a finger into her warm vagina. While I was doing this I kissed her lips and my tongue met hers. I then felt her bottom and thighs roving from one to the other. All these touchings excited us both to the highest pitch. I suddenly threw off all the coverings of the bed and by the aid of the candle examined all her charms. Cordelia made no resistance whatever, 
but, grasping my stiff rod in her hand, commenced to move the foreskin backwards and forwards. I kissed her on the eyes and mouth, and addressed the most endearing epithets to her. She was almost crazy with delirious delight. "'Come, darling!' she exclaimed. "'Put it into me, or I shall die!' I immediately rolled on top of her, and in a moment I had pierced her to the very quick. A few rapid motions, and I had inundated the mouth of her womb with a flood of boiling sperm. It would take me too long to relate all the different ways in which I enjoyed the beautiful Cordelia. Sometimes I lay on top of her, at others she lay on top of me. Sometimes I did it sideways, sometimes I did it kneeling, sometimes before and sometimes behind. Sometimes when I was in a hurry and met her in a retired place, I would place her on a trunk, a chair, a mattress, and achieve the results in the most extraordinary position. More than once I made her stoop forward with her head and hands resting on a trunk, and throwing her petticoats over her head from behind, I would regale myself by the sight of her delicious white cool, with her delicate con peeping between her white thighs, and releasing my member from its ordinary place of concealment. I would force it to the very hilt into her body, her beautiful bottom just fitting the hollow of my thighs. One night I stripped her entirely naked as well as myself. I then strewed a large quantity of roses on the floor, and made her pick them up, naked as she was, all the time watching her by the light of the lamp. The different postures she assumed were delicious to contemplate. I then rubbed some essence of jasmine on her polished skin, and applied some on my own body. We threw ourselves on the bed, and assumed a hundred different positions. At last I caused her to kneel before me, and handled at will her belly, her thighs, her bubbies, and at last, though not the least, delicious, her con, pressing the two lips together, playing the hair on her mount, titillating her clitoris, and exploring the innermost recesses of her vagina. She appeared to enjoy all these follies as much as myself. I then made her incline forward on her hands and knees, and mounted on her back. I maintained this position some little time, then I brought my member down between her two fleshy buttocks, and knocked at the trou de son cou. I did not, however, enter there, but opening the lips of the legitimate passage with my two fingers, I inserted my dart into her ruby sheath, and a few in-and-out motions soon brought down a shower of bliss. We now rose up, and, naked as we were, sat down near the fire. I produced a bottle of cordial, with which I had provided myself, and the fire of desire soon burned in our eyes again. We kissed each other over and over. At last I took her by the arm, and drew her from her seat in a standing posture, and tried to enter her while in this position, but I could not accomplish it. She was so excited that she seized my member in her hand, and, dragging me to the bed, fell on her back, pulled me on top of her, and guided my instrument into her salacious slit. The bed creaked with our motions, but I paid no attention to it, and drove into her delicious body with all my might. She, returning heave for heave, we both soon discharged copiously. We rested an hour, and then I inclined her with her belly on the bed. By this means her beautiful cool was completely exposed to my attack. In the first place I put my instrument between her buttocks, and moved it backwards and forwards in this position. I do not know how it was, but the head of my engine struck against Le Trou de Son Coul. The contact evidently titillated her, for she wiggled her bottom and begged me l'enculé. Without any further ceremony I moistened the head of my instrument, and, separating the two chicks of her fesses, I forced my vit into the narrow passage. She aided me by every means in her power, raising her buttocks to meet my attack. In a moment I was plunged au fond de son cul. How delicious it was! How tightly was my engine grasped by the narrow sheath! I passed my hand around her belly and put one of the fingers into her con, titillating the lips of this seat of happiness. Cordelia was beyond herself. She lay palpitating on her belly, and her whole body was in agitation. Every thrust that I gave from behind caused my fingers to be buried deeply into her sensitive quiver, and the cheeks of her bottom trembled with the shock. Her sensitive vagina contracted, and she discharged before me, but when I felt my fingers moistened, I withdrew them from their warm nest, and seizing her by her hips, pushed my member for the last time into the narrow path, 
and she drew from me the liquor of love in such great profusion that when i withdrew my lance from its asylum the white cushions of her buttocks were inundated with my metal when all was over i assisted her to rise and we were satisfied for the time for our scene had been a prolonged one i left her after assuring her of my devotion at last the time came for me to leave school, and I lost sight of the beautiful Cordelia. When I returned home I was quite a young man, and my experience with my preceptor's daughter had lighted such a fire in me that I was soon looking about for a means to gratify my passion. I determined that Margaret Murdoch should be the next to receive my embraces, and I began immediately to lay my plans for the purpose of effecting that object. Margaret was the daughter of a widow lady who resided in the village. She was a gloriously beautiful girl, about eighteen years of age. Her hair was a sunny auburn and hung in natural curls around a snow-white neck. She was voluptuously made and extremely graceful. I managed to get introduced to her and visited the house quite frequently. I had frequent opportunities to see her alone, and you may rely upon it I did not let the grass grow under my feet. In a few days I had advanced so far as to put my arms around her waist and kiss her. Although at first she somewhat resisted these embraces, she eventually submitted to them, and even returned my kisses. One warm day in the spring of the year I called at her mother's house as usual, and was informed by the servant that Mrs. Murdoch was not home, and would not return before evening, but that Miss Margaret was in the drawing-room. I ran upstairs, and found her seated on a rocking-chair, engaged in sewing. I ran up to her and shook her by the hand, asking tenderly after her health. She answered me with civility, and I took a seat close by her side, and gazed fixedly on her beautiful face. We conversed on different subjects a little while, then I passed my arm around her waist, and kissed her. She made no resistance, but a deep blush suffused her face and neck. "'Kiss me, darling,' I whispered in her ear. The charming creature advanced her face towards mine, and brought her lips in contact with my own. Before she was aware of it, I gently inserted my tongue into her mouth. This species of kissing appeared to please her, for a shiver ran through her body, and I met with hers in reply. I now glided my hand down the front of her dress, and felt her plump, firm white bubbies, first moulding and pressing them, then forcing my hand as far as possible toward her smooth belly. She murmured a few words of objection to these enterprises on my part, so I withdrew my hand and drew her on my knees. I now commenced to kiss her eagerly, during which time I was cautiously raising her petticoats with my fingers. At last my hand came in contact with her naked thighs. When I felt her deliciously formed limbs, I could scarcely restrain myself, but pressed her frantically to my heart. Margaret appeared to be as much excited as I was, and I saw her direct her eyes to the front of my trousers, which, I assure you, stuck out in a very unseemly manner. "'Someone might come,' said the charming girl. Her cheek dyed with the deepest crimson, and she suddenly jumped from my lap, and, running to the door, shut and bolted it. She then returned to me, and I drew her between my legs. "'I love you, darling,' I exclaimed and while speaking I raised her petticoats from behind with one hand, until it rested on her magnificently formed buttocks. How firm and smooth were those white cushions, and what pleasure I took in manipulating them at will! With my unoccupied hand I seized one of hers and brought it down on my rampant member, which was so stiff and unruly that it was ready to burst the bonds which confined it. Finding that she made no resistance to my proceedings, I unbuttoned the front of my trousers, and my staff nestled itself in her grasp. She was evidently astonished at the size and condition of my member. "'You must be aware, darling,' I exclaimed, "'that this ought to be hidden from sight, and you have a place proper to receive it.' So saying, I carried her in my arms to a sofa, and placing her on it on her back, I threw her skirts over her head, disclosing to my gaze her body naked from her belly to her feet. Ye gods, how I feasted my eyes on the glorious sight! I passed my hands over all her hidden charms. Now it was her smooth white belly, now it was her voluminous thighs, now it was her delicious bottom, and at last it was her lovely con, embowered in a mass of auburn hair. 
I pressed the two lips of this abode of bliss together. I turned my fingers in the curly thicket adorning her mount, and even advanced one into the narrow opening of her vagina. I was now determined on action, and seating myself on the sofa I drew her onto my lap, with her face towards me, and my knees between her thighs. I let down my trousers, raised my shirt, and directed my lance towards her rubicund opening. I soon felt it come in contact with her hairy slit. I then opened the two lips of her con with my fingers and thumb, and jutting my buttocks forward I felt myself penetrate a little way into her warm vagina. I hurt her, however, a good deal, and she begged of me to desist, but I only altered my position slightly, and making her open her thighs to the widest extent, I again pushed forward, but she again compelled me to stop, complaining that I hurt her dreadfully. I explained to her that the pain would be but momentary, and that when I had once forced a passage, the most delicious pleasures would follow, but seeing she still resisted, I determined to try another mode. I again placed her lengthwise on the sofa, and threw myself on top of her, but it was of no use. I could not enter. I withdrew from her, and began to curse my ill luck. I kissed her, felt her con, and advanced a finger into her vagina, to see what progress I had done. I found it was very little indeed. To my great joy I saw on the chimney-piece a pot of pomade. I immediately appropriated it, and anointed my staff. I now placed the dear girl on her hands and knees on the floor and throwing up her clothes I entered her from behind. It was now comparatively easy work, and in a second her magnificent bottom was in contact with my belly, my instrument having entered her vagina to the very hilt. I paused a moment to observe the beauties before me, and then commenced slowly the in-and-out movement. Margaret was already in the seventh heaven of enjoyment. Her white buttocks shivered with the shocks of my thrusts. I passed my hand in front, and handled her bubbies, her belly, and the upper part of her slit, titillating her clitoris. At last the die-away moment approached, and I seized her by her buttocks and drove furiously into her. Her thirsty vagina sucked from me the essence of life, which mingled with her own discharge, and she sank exhausted on her belly. When she had recovered, I took her to her chamber, which was the very next room, and we both threw ourselves on the bed having both stripped naked. The contact of our warm bodies soon restored our powers, and we indulged in a thousand follies. In a state of nature she appeared perfectly lovely, and I was never tired of admiring her smooth satin skin, her voluptuous bosom, her swelling thighs, her whole belly, and her delicious mons veneris. She too gratified her curiosity by falling all over my body, she half threw herself on top of me, and gluing her lips to mine, she at the same time amused herself titillating my testicles. While thus engaged, her snowy bubbies beat against my chest, while her moss-covered slit rubbed against my thigh. These touchings and titillations worked me up to such a pitch that I could endure it no longer. I drew her to the edge of the bed, first placing a pillow under her bottom, and raising one of her thighs in the air, I rested it on my arm. By this means her lovely slit was completely exposed to my attack. She opened the luscious lips herself, with her finger and thumb, so that I could see the coral interior. I brought my staff to bear on the inviting entrance, and with a single heave of my buttocks I completely gorged her vagina. I rode, however, easily in the harbour, and the dear girl experienced all the joys of a perfect conjunction, without any pain. At first my motions were slow, but as our delirium increased they grew faster. She met my thrust by responsive heaves of her bottom until we could both hold out no longer, but both discharged simultaneously. I shall not tell you, dear girls, how many times I enjoyed the beautiful Margaret before I left her, for fear that you should think that I exaggerate. I only know that when I quitted her apartment I was completely exhausted, and that it took several days for me to recover my wonted energy. I found Margaret adept in the science of love. She soon learned every mode and posture for performing the sexual act, and we had many, many happy hours together. One day we were playing together in the summer-house attached to the house. She began the play of love by kissing me, and forcing her tongue into my mouth she imitated with that organ the conjugal act. By this mode of procedure she illumined a fire in my body, and I pressed her to my heart in delirium. 
She then unbuttoned my trousers, and, seizing my instrument, rubbed it between her hands. I drew her on my knees and raised up her petticoats at the same time. I let down my pantaloons and felt her naked bottom resting against my belly. How delicious was the sensation of her warm buttocks! My staff forced an entrance between her two thighs, and she leaned forward and kissed it a thousand times, occasionally rubbing it against her lovely con. She even lodged it between the two lips, and by moving her buttocks titillated it in this position. Supreme pleasure began to run through my veins, and I was on the eve of discharging when, slightly raising her cool, she guided the stiffened dart of love to the entrance of her vagina, and in another moment I was au fond de son cul. She leaned forward in such a manner that I could see my staff enter in and out of her coral sheath. She moved her buttocks, and after a few violent thrusts I felt her parts contract on my piercer, and she pumped the sperm from my testicles at the same moment that she herself discharged profusely. My acquaintance with Margaret lasted four months, during which time we took our surfeit of love's enjoyments. At the end of that time I left to pay a visit to an uncle who lived in the village of B in the state of Pennsylvania, a few miles from where I now reside. My uncle was a bachelor, possessed of large wealth, and it was generally understood that I was to be his heir. The village I have just referred to was a very quiet place, consisting only of about two hundred inhabitants. It contained, however, a church and a clergyman, who was a widower with an only daughter. I first saw Helen Roberts at chapel the Sunday following my arrival. I was immediately struck with her beauty. Her features were perfectly regular and classical. Her eyes were large, lustrous, and dreamy. Her bust was faultless, and her whole form was as if it had been moulded by the God of love himself. I was soon destined to know her more intimately. One afternoon, after I had been at my uncle's about two weeks, I happened to stroll into the church, and the first sight that met my eyes was Helen Roberts herself lying fast asleep in one of the pews. The day was very warm, and she had doubtless entered the holy edifice for the purpose of resting herself, and, feeling tired, sleep had overcome her. Her dress was slightly discomposed at her feet, revealing a considerable portion of her magnificently formed limbs. I advanced cautiously to her side, and saw that she slept soundly. I could not resist the temptation offered me, but gently raised her petticoats. She wore no drawers, and all the secrets of her charming person were entirely exposed to my gaze. The sight of her lovely white belly, her naked thighs, and her pretty, hairy bijou inflamed me in the highest degree, and in a moment my lance was as stiff as a poker. I passed my hand over her belly, and although a shiver ran through her at the contact, she did not awake. I then gently divided her thighs, and handled at pleasure all the charms of the domain of Venus. I played with the hair surmounting that lovely spot. I inserted a finger in the passage, and titillated her clitoris, which I found finally developed. My touches became more and more exciting, until I believed she was on the point of discharging, when she suddenly awoke and found herself in my arms. My instrument was rubbing against her thighs, but I had not effected an entrance. The charming girl, when she found the condition of affairs, took it in good part. She kissed me. However, we were so excited that we both discharged before the act of coition was effected. I now led her into the vestry room, near the pulpit, and, seating myself on a chair, pulled her on my knees. I unfastened her dress, and, exposing her two breasts, repeatedly kissed and handled them. I made her put one of her feet on the table, while her other leg hung between mine, by this means leaving her thighs stretched widely apart. I forced a finger into her slit, while she seized my instrument. I commenced moving my finger. She did the same with her hand, and in a few moments we again discharged, experiencing the most delicious sensations. After a little repose we recommenced. She longed for something more satisfying, and endeavoured to excite me. She seized my staff, covering and uncovering the ruby head. She even took the whole of my rod into her mouth, palpating it with her tongue, while at the same moment she tickled my testicles and bottom. Nor was I idle, for I pressed and kissed her bubbies, sucking the strawberry nipples, stroking down her belly and titillating her anus. 
I then kneeled down, and making her open her thighs widely apart, I inserted my tongue into her slit, titillating the sides of her vagina and sucking her clitoris. Helen was almost mad with the intensity of her desires, and was ready to spend again, when she had the satisfaction of seeing my instrument attain such an enormous size that when she again took it in her mouth, it filled it completely. Giving it a last kiss, she threw herself on a hassock, and pulling up all her clothes above her navel, thus leaving her body entirely naked from there downward, spreading her legs open and slightly bending her knees, she exclaimed, Come, love, embrace me well. Bury your staff into the deepest and most secret recesses of my body. Do not spare me. I did not have to be told twice, for I was on her in a moment. I gently introduced the head of my instrument between the lips of her slit, but it would not enter. It was in vain. I pushed. I could make no headway, but only gave her a great deal of pain. After a little trying of this nature, she was getting exhausted, and told me, for God's sake, to finish my work. I then withdrew my instrument, and wetting the end of it with spittle, again brought it to bear on the entrance of the abode of bliss. As soon as I got the head well between the lips, I began to shove. She was determined, however, to be aggressive with me, and with a tremendous heave of her bottom impaled herself to the hilt on my rod, so much so that the hair surrounding our genitals intermingled. She could not avoid shrieking out, but the pain soon began to pass off, and after a few more shoves she evidently began to experience the most delicious sensations. Every thrust I gave sent a liquid fire of delirium through her veins. When she felt my instrument rubbing the sensitive sides of her vagina, she appeared as if she would die with pleasure. Her breasts rose and fell, and her buttocks actually quivered with the delights of her sensations. My motion grew faster, my testicles tingled with delight at every shove against her bottom. She threw her legs about in confusion, and met every thrust more than halfway. She wiggled herself from side to side on my staff. The finale came. Herbert, I am coming. Oh, God, what pleasure! Dear Herbert, closer, closer, clo She pantingly exclaimed, and a profuse discharge from the innermost recesses of her body met my own. We got up and adjusted our clothing, and I promised her I would visit her the next night in her own room, the access to which was very easy, and I returned home to reflect on all the pleasures I had experienced. Stop, Herbert, said Amy interrupting her brother-in-law in his recital before you continue your history you must give me relief your descriptions are so voluptuous and lascivious that my slit is on fire come darling you are in fine condition i seconded amy's request being no less excited myself herbert was indeed in splendid condition for performing the rites of venus we all rose from the couch stand up amy said herbert Put one of your feet on this chair, and let the other rest on the ground. There, that's it. Now your plump thighs are widely separated, and I can manipulate your pretty little con. Oh, do, darling, returned the delighted girl. Now I'm going to titillate your clitoris with my tongue, said Herbert. Amy placed herself in the position required. Herbert seated himself on the ground between her thighs, and brought his mouth in contact with her slit. He divided the lips of her bijou with his tongue, and forced it in and out of the rosy cavity. Amy, said Herbert, when he had indulged in this play a few moments, you have got the prettiest little con in the world. What soft down adorns this hallowed spot, what delicious folding lips, and what a sweet morsel is your clitoris. How glorious it is to enjoy you to one's heart's content. Just fancy this the first time you had ever come in contact with a man. Let me rehearse the scene. He would first of all play with your bubbies. He would press and kiss them, as I do now. He would suck these rosy nipples, until he had excited you to the last degree. He would then grow bolder, but you must lie down for me to perform the scene properly. Amy threw her entire length on the divan while I watched with delighted eyes this delicious scene enjoying it as much as if I were the recipient instead of his beautiful sister-in-law. When he saw your delicious white belly, continued Herbert, he would shiver with delight and fasten his lips to it. Thus, and thus, he would then pass his hand backwards and forwards on this smooth white plain, and endeavour to peer into the mysteries seated below. In another moment his hand would invade your delicious little con, just as mine does now. His finger separates the lips, and he gently rubs your clitoris. 
You are mad with delight. You open your thighs and wriggle your bottom under his touches. He pushes one of his fingers into your con and moves it in and out, as I do now. Oh, darling, it is too much. I cannot bear it, cried the delighted girl, writhing and wriggling her body about in the most delicious manner possible, at the same time seizing Herbert's staff and rubbing it up and down. Having toyed with each other some time, continued Herbert, he suddenly fixes his lips on your delicate slit and pushes his tongue between the lips, and while thus employed he tickles your bottom. You are just ready to spend and beg him for heaven's sake to finish with you. He divides your thighs as I do now, and mounts you in this manner. Herbert suited the action to the word and threw himself on Amy's belly. She herself guided his instrument into her coral sheath, and they both commenced the work of thrust and heave. Delicious! Splendid! exclaimed Amy. I can feel your lovely instrument in my vagina. Go on, go on. He moves his bottom as I do mine, and soon discharges as I do now. My darling girl, your lovely slit has extracted the last drop from me. I too, gasped Amy. There, there. I was so excited at witnessing this voluptuous scene that I was obliged to give myself relief by rubbing my clitoris. I emitted at the same moment they did. What delight I have enjoyed, said Amy when she had somewhat recovered. But continue your history, dear Herbert. Herbert recommenced in the terms to be found in the next chapter. End of Volume 1, Chapter 5